Beloved, grace and peace be unto you. From God who loves us as a Father and Jesus who alone is our resurrected, our risen, and our reigning, returning Redeemer. This is yet another day that the Lord has made and regardless of the circumstances and situations in which we find ourselves, we vow that we've come to rejoice and to be glad in it. How grateful we are to God for this season of revival where we gather together for these next few nights to engage in the hearing, the reading, the preaching, and the living out of the Holy Word of God. I am thankful as always to a father in ministry, a mentor, Reverend Dr. Bishop Walter Thomas Sr. for not only the calling together, but the invitation to gather in this space believing that God is still doing a new thing in our lives. I must say to you that there's always a joy coming to New Psalmist even when your face is not in the seat. There's a spirit here that reminds me that we are still on holy ground. And I'm grateful to God to stand in this place where Bishop preaches and teaches the word of God even during this pandemic. I'm grateful to God to join alongside my brothers and brother Bill Curtis and Walter Thomas Jr. And my prayers that as they would come on these next few nights, that the Holy Spirit will move in mighty ways to encourage us to believe that our God is yet undone in the midst of all we experience and see. God's hand is still at work. Won't you bow and be in prayer with me as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear a word from the Lord our God. Lord, we bow before you today, thankful for another day that you've granted us. Thank you for grace that has been sufficient and mercy that has been brand new. Thank you for love that is unconquerable and inseparable. Thank you, O oh God, for brothers and sisters connected in this virtual space. And we declare that I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Lord, we ask now that you would invade this worship. We invoke your presence and your power. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we do pray. Amen. Beloved, I th think it goes without saying that this year has been a rough and a difficult year. As a matter of fact, to say that 2020 has been difficult is probably the understatement of the year. This has been a year when we've had to learn to make constant adjustments in the midst of uncertainty. A year when questions exponentially outweigh answers. A year when we've had to navigate in waters that we've never sailed through before. We've seen businesses close and bankruptcy shut down industries that will never be reopened again. We've struggled with online education and ways to make certain that our children still form and develop while sitting in front of computer screens at home. We've had to deal with an inescapable presence in the very valley of the shadow of death. COVID-19 has claimed more than 230,000 lives in this nation alone. From January till now, we've been bombarded with the constant killing of unarmed black and brown bodies at the hands of those called to serve and protect. We've sat by and we've watched legends and icons and figures of our faith and our movement pass on to go home to be with the Lord on high. This has been a difficult year. And even now in November, we come to the end of this year, Bishop, almost asking the same question that Gideon asked God when the Lord calls Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and says, God has an assignment on your life. Gideon looks back at the angel and says, if God is with us, why is all this happening to us? And beloved, none of us are immune from that question. Life can put you in such a bind, dealing with so many uncertainties, struggles, and suffering, that you begin to wonder, if God is with us, why is all this happening? 
in the midst of these uncertain days, in the midst of the struggles of our season, in the midst of the valley of the death that we find ourselves navigating through. I come today on this night to share with you a word from the Lord that prayerfully will encourage us to know that God is yet on the throne. I would encourage you to turn to your Bibles with me, but, but I'm afraid you don't need your Bible for this verse. If you've been raised in church, if you've been around the body of Christ for any amount of time, my gut feeling is you already know this verse. You don't even have to open your Bible. This verse is right up there with the Lord is my shepherd. This verse is right up there with weeping only endures for a night. This verse can be compared with no weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is the verse that holds its head with they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. In the book of Romans, in chapter 8 and verse 28, you hear these words of Paul that, that echo in our hearing tonight. In Romans 8 and verse 28, Paul declares this, For we know that all things work together for good, for them that love God are the called according to his purpose. For we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. One more time for good measure, for we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Do me a favor if you would, you're taking notes, if you're chatting, if you got someone nearby, just tell them these words, it's all good. It's all good. Beloved, Romans 8.28, one of those verses that holds you together when it seems like life is trying to pull you apart. Romans 8.28 is what you remind yourself of when bad news catches you off guard. Romans 8.28, that's what you speak over your life when you find out that your friends are fake and your enemies are real. Romans 8.28 is what you tell yourself when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you know it's about to be a rough day. Romans 8.28 is what you quote when it seems like everything in your life is going from bad to worse. Romans 8.28, that's what you meditate on when you're anxious about the unknown and the uncertain and you don't know when and how and where things are going to work out. Romans 8.28. That's what you quote when you're watching election results come in and at the beginning of the news cycle, it seems like things are not going to go favorably in your way, but yet you hold on and you remind yourself of this. We know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Beloved, there are a few passages in Scripture that give you as much assurance and hope and faith in God as these words Paul writes to this young church in Rome as they are preparing to face a season of persecution under the emperorship of Nero. And Paul sends them these words to let them know, we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. If you would hang out in this one verse with me tonight and let's explore some of the bounty of its beauty. Paul says, beloved, we know. Now before you rush on too fast and before you skip over that, Bishop, that seems to suggest that this verse is not universally applicable to all people and all places. It seems like this verse is written to a group called we. We know. And one of the very first questions we must ask as we begin to dig into the beauty and bounty of this scripture, who is we? Who are the we that Paul is addressing? Who is it that knows all things work together for good? Who are the we that Paul is addressing? Well, it seems to me that the question of the we in the beginning of the verse is really answered at the end of the verse because at the end of the verse, Paul says it works together for a particular group of people. For them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Who's the we? The ones that love God 
and are called according to his purpose. If you begin in that very first passage about them that love God, that is a direct reference to Paul's Jewish heritage. That phrase, love God, comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it is part of the Israeli religious ritual called the Shema. Let the church say Shema, S-H-E-M-A. The Shema was critical to the Jews. It, it came out of Deuteronomy 6, which told them that they are to love God. And Bishop, as you know, the Shema was so critical that the Jews to this day recite it twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. They start their day by saying, we love God. They end their day by saying, we love God. The Shema identified them by their religion and their ritual and their routine. The Shema identified them as the people of God. The Shema was what they whispered in their mouths so that everyone would know we believe there is a God somewhere. The Shema was what they spoke so that when people saw them, they knew they were the people of God. As a matter of fact, the Shema is so critical that if you ever encounter an Orthodox Jewish male, he's probably wearing something called a phylactery. A phylactery is a box that is bound around his forehead. And in that box are the words of Deuteronomy, which says, you shall love the Lord your God. The Shema was what identified them. It was their ritual. It was their routine. It was their religion. It's what let the world know they believed in God. But what I find very interesting is that Paul says the assurance that things work together for good is not limited to those who simply know how to say they love God. But you must also be those who are called according to his purpose. If you've been following Paul in Romans, you know that when Paul speaks about the purpose of God, he's speaking about salvation in and through Jesus Christ. And what Paul is declaring, listen, my beloved, it is not simply enough to have it bound on your forehead. It is not enough to have it come out of the words of your mouth. It's not enough for it just to be in your lips. But you must also have accepted and believed in salvation and new life that is only made available through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Paul wants the church to understand that you cannot simply go through the rituals and the routine of religion and think that that's enough to claim the promise of this verse. You must also believe in your heart that in Jesus Christ, new life is made available. In Jesus Christ, the grace of God shines on us. In Jesus Christ, God is doing a new thing in your life. You can't claim it without knowing Christ. Lord, I came by to preach that tonight because the world is filled with folk who can check the first box, but not the second. The world is filled with folk who can utter God on their lips, but have no Christ in their heart. The world is filled with folk who can talk religious and sound religious and look religious, but don't have the love of Jesus Christ in their heart. Anybody can say they believe in God. Anybody can call on God when they need something. Anybody can thank God when they get what they want. Anybody can act like they walk with God when they need God to deliver them out of something. But Brother Paul declares it is not enough to simply say that you love God, you must also belong to God. And believing in God does not mean you belong to God. Anybody can get on stage at an award show and say, first of all, giving honor to God who is the head of my life. That is not the criteria, Paul says. The criteria is do you know Jesus? Beloved, believing in God does not mean you belong to God. Devils believe in God. Demons can come to church. Demons can hold Bibles upside down outside of church buildings and act like they're religious when it's politically correct to do so. But Paul asked the question, do you know Christ in the pardon of your sins? Have you denied yourself and taken up your cross and followed him? Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Do you believe in him and do you follow him? 
So I came by to ask you before you run into Romans 8, 28 and start shouting that all things work together for good. I came to ask you a question. Are you part of the we? Are you one who simply says you love God? Or are you also called according to God's purpose and walking in the new life that only Christ can make available to us? Paul says we, we know. We know. B Bishop, I'm amazed that Paul does not say we believe. Paul does not say we wish. Paul does not say we hope. P Paul says, here's what I want you to know. We know that all things work together for good. But P P Paul, how can you say that? With all that's about to happen in the Roman Empire, with all that's about to go down as Nero now comes to the throne, with all that the Christian church is about to endure, how can you look into the future and say with certainty and assurance that we know all things work together for good? How can you look at a cancer diagnosis and know it's gonna work for your good? How can you look at a pending divorce and know it's gonna work for your good? How can you get a pink slip and know it's gonna work for your good? How can the bottom of your life drop out and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's gonna work out for your good? I had to wrestle with this because it seems to me that this is wishful thinking. It seems to me that this is just the power of positive thought. It seems to me that this is just some hope that things will work out. Until I began to do a little research since I knew I was coming to New Psalmist. I looked up that word to know. In Greek, there are several verbs that can be used for know. And the Greek verb that Paul uses here is a Greek verb, eido, E-I-D-O. Somebody say eido. And although eido can be translated as to know, Bishop, it, it's better translated as to see. Because eido knowledge is knowledge that is acquired through observation. D don't miss this. Eido knowledge is knowledge that is acquired by observation. Let me give you an example. So I can say to you, I know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And if you ask me how I know it rises in the east, my idol knowledge says I know it rises in the east because I've seen it rise in the east. How do I know? Because I have seen. How do I know? Because I have seen. So when Paul declares that we know all things work together for good, this is not some promise about the future. It's more a testimony about the past. Paul is not making a promise of tomorrow. Paul is primarily testifying about yesterday. How do I know things will work together for good? Because I've seen it before. I've seen God make a way out of no way. I've seen God answer prayer. I've seen God go exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ask or think. I've seen God turn a life around. I've seen seen God open a door no one can close. I've seen God turn weeping into joy. I've seen God do great things in my life. What have you seen God do? Beloved, I came by to tell you that the advice of Brother Paul is this, that when you look at your future uncertain of what will be, when you're worried about what tomorrow will bring, when life is not moving according to your dreams and desires. Don't be anxious about what you don't know in tomorrow, but take a moment to pause 
and remember your yesterday and claim what God has already shown you. He's already shown his hand strong. He's already shown that he can deliver. He's already shown that he will answer prayer. He's already shown that he will move mountains. He's already shown that he's a healer. And every now and then, you've got to remember what God has shown you. We know we who love the Lord and are called in Jesus Christ, we know what we have seen. Now, now, as you know, as a student of Bible, that Paul's original letter to the church in Rome is not written in English. It's written in Koine Greek, which means that any English translation you read, someone has taken the Greek and translated it for you, for it to make sense for you. And one of the things I encourage you to do as you study Romans 8, 28 is read it in different translations. When you read it in the New International Version, it reads differently than any other one. The New International Version reads like this, for we know that in all things, God works together for the good of them who love him and are called according to his purpose. Notice the subtle difference in the New International Version. The New International Version identifies the subject of the verb. If you remember your grammar, the verb is the action, the subject is the controller, and the New International Version says this, we know that in all things God, the subject, works the verb all things together for good. The New International Version makes certain that you know who the subject controlling the verb is, that God is in control. That things working together for good, that isn't just accidental, that isn't just random. That's God exerting divine control over your circumstance and your situation. The New International Version makes it clear God is in control. Now the problem with that is that in the original Koine Greek manuscript, Paul does not name God as the subject. As a matter of fact, in the original Koine Greek, there is no subject to match the verb. It's almost grammatically incorrect. In the original Greek, it just reads like this. We know all things work together for good. There is no mention of theos. There is no naming of God. Paul does not identify that God is in control. Paul, how can you write this promise, this assurance, and not identify that God is in control? How can you write a grammatically incorrect sentence and leave out the subject of the verb? How can you simply say all things work together for good, but never give God the credit for God working it out? I was wrestling with Brother Paul, and I heard Paul say this to me, the reason I did not name God as the subject of the verb, the reason I did not say God works it all together for good, the reason I did not name God as being in control, it's because, Howard, that's something you ought to already know. <laughs> I should not have to tell you who made a way out of no way. I shouldn't have to identify who opened the door for you. I shouldn't have to name the God that answered your prayer. When you look back over your life and you see the things you've come through, only a fool would think you made it by yourself. Only a fool would think your degree got you where you are. Only a fool would think your money made a way. When you look back over your life, it ought to be clear that God was in control. God was making a way. God was answering prayers. God was moving mountains. God was lifting your head. God was giving you strength. God held your life together. I came by on a Monday night to say shame on any Christian who needs someone to translate for you how you got where you are. 
Shame on any Christian that needs someone to give you some commentary that God made a way. Shame on a Christian that needs a preacher to remind you that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, you would not be where you are right now. Is there anybody watching on a Monday night who knows that God made a way? Is there anybody watching who knows the Lord answered my prayer? Is there anybody watching who knows that God put his hand on my life and God made a way. Do me a favor, touch somebody, tell them it had to be God. It had to be God. It had to be God. For we who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, we know because we've seen that God works all things together for good. Good, 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 good. Good is this Greek word agathos. It is the rooting of the name agatha. And agathos doesn't just mean good. Agathos means beneficial. Agathos means it's it's doing something in me and on me. Agathos means it's developing me. Agathos means it's strengthening me. Agathos means it's making me better. Agathos means that whatever my thing I'm going through, it's strengthening me and developing me and maturing me and changing me and making me what God wants me to be. Now, 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 I've got to wrestle right here for a moment because Paul seems to suggest that until God gets involved, it may not have been good. Until God puts God's hand on it, it may not have been beneficial. It may have been destructive. It may have been malicious. It may have been destroying me until God put God's hand on it, that it did not start good, but it ended good. Boy, that'll preach right there. It may not have started as a blessing, but it'll end as a blessing. It may not have started strengthening me, but it'll end strengthening me. It may not have been making me better, but at the end, God will use it to make me better. Here's the good news, that it doesn't matter how it starts. All you need to do is put it in the hands of God. And the God we serve is able to work it together for my good. It may have been killing me, but God used it to strengthen me. It may have been casting me down, but God used it to build me up. It may have been wrecking my mind, but God used it to give me wisdom. Is there anybody here that can look at how it started and compare it to how it ended and say God must have showed up and God turned it around for my good. Somebody holler good, good, good. It works together for good. L listen, I'm almost done. It, g God can turn it around, B but it's got to work together for good. That, that, that word for is a Greek word, uh, ice, E-I-S. And, and ice doesn't just mean for good, it means into good. And, and part of what Paul argues is that when you love God and are in the purpose of Christ, you've seen what God can do. He'll take what started one way and change it into another but it's got to work into good. Into suggests that it might take some time. This is where it becomes frustrating because it doesn't work into good immediately. It doesn't shift overnight. Romans 8, 28 is not some verse you can quote in a prayer, say amen, and then demand that things change the next moment. Paul says it works together 
into good. It suggests that every now and then, I've got to give God some time. I've got to let the Lord work it out in his way, in his will, at his time. Can you give God some time? Can you trust God for a few hours? Can you try God for a few days? Can you walk with God through a full season? Can you hold to his unchanging hand? If it doesn't change on Monday, if it's not over by Friday, if it's still happening next week, if you're still walking through it next month, if you're still dealing with it next year, can you still give God some time? Now I know, I know, I know, I know somebody you're frustrated, you're saying, if God is God, if God is omnipotent, why does it take time? Why can't God fix it overnight? And the answer is simple, because what God is doing for you is not limited to you. Here's the problem with the saints. We're so selfish that we think God only works on our behalf. And God is arguing with someone the reason it's taking time is because I'm not simply answering your prayer. I'm trying to do some other things around you so that when your prayer gets answered, you aren't the only one that's blessed. Okay, okay, okay. I see some of you ain't feeling me. Uh, let me help you right here. So, so you're praying for God to make your job a little better. But the reason you're unhappy on your job is that you've got a coworker who's mean and evil. But the reason your coworker is mean and evil is because her spouse is abusive. But the reason her spouse is abusive is because her spouse is an alcoholic. And the reason her spouse is an alcoholic is because he hasn't gotten a raise on his job. And the reason he hasn't gotten a raise on his job is because his supervisor doesn't respect him. But the reason his supervisor doesn't respect him is because his wife is cheating at home. And so God says, watch this, in order to answer your prayer, I've got to break an adulterous affair between a wife and her adulterer. I've got to reconcile a husband and a wife. I've got to make a supervisor value his employee. I've got to let the employee get a raise. After the employee gets a raise, I've got to deliver him from alcoholism. And then I've got to restore his heart for his wife. And then his wife will be better on the job. And so by the time your prayer gets answered, a marriage has been restored. An addiction has been broken. An adulterous fair hasn't ended. A raise has been given. A life has been changed. And God says it took some time. But now that I'm done, everybody around you, do me a favor. Touch somebody, tell them, give God some time. Give God some time. Trust in him. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage because they that wait on the Lord shall renew all of their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. Trust in God. Uh, Bishop, I'm done. I, I thank you for the invitation. Uh, we who love Lord and are called according to his purpose, we know what we've seen, that God works all things together for good no matter how it started, if we give him some time. But the one word that messes with me most in this passage is that Paul says all things work together for good together for good together for good that one word seems to imply that God takes what we don't like and God doesn't remove it he just reorders it so that it works for our good God doesn't keep us from it God blesses us in spite of it God doesn't remove it from our lives God just adds some other things to it. That God doesn't keep you from the struggle. 
He doesn't keep you from the sickness. He doesn't keep you from the pain. He doesn't keep you from the agony. But he uses it in spite of it to work it together for your good. Now, God, I would rather you take it from me. I'd rather you keep me from it. I'd rather you remove it from my life. But God says that's not omnipotence. Omnipotence works in spite of it. Omnipotence works in the midst of it. Omnipotence works together with it. That God is so much God that God doesn't have to take it off your plate. God can leave it on the plate and still bless you in spite of it. Okay, I got to go. I see someone ain't feeling me the way I want you to. Uh, let me see if I explain it like this. Uh, I, my church knows that I love to cook. It's therapy for me to get in the kitchen and, and to cook. And whatever I like to eat, I've learned to cook. A little while ago, my Louisiana roots began to spring up in me. And I decided that when the weather changed, I wanted some gumbo. My, my Louisiana kicked in. And I wanted some gumbo with some andouille sausage and some shrimp and oysters and some chicken. I sat down to make gumbo. But I decided I wasn't going to make it by myself. I was going to teach my sons how to cook and make gumbo. So we started by making the roux. That's the, the flour and the butter. And Bishop, you can't rush your roux. You got to take your time making the roux. A, a rushed roux doesn't make good gumbo. It takes some time to make it right. And after we made the roux and were starting to put the ingredients in, I let my sons add some of the seasonings. I told one, you put some salt in. I told the other, you put the garlic in. I told one of them, now you put the crushed red pepper in. And after we had made all the ingredients and had finished the roux and had made the gumbo, I tasted what we made. And Bishop, it did not taste right. There was too much crushed red pepper. It was too spicy. It did not taste right. There was too much salt in it. It was overly salty. It did not taste right. The roux was too soupy and too watery. And I thought for a moment that I had to throw the gumbo out. But then I remembered, because I learned how to cook, that if it doesn't taste right, and if there's some stuff in the pot that I wish wasn't in the pot, I don't have to throw it all out. I know how to add some stuff in it that can make it taste better. So because it was too spicy, I sprinkled some sugar in it because the sugar takes down the heat. Because it was too salty, I dropped a potato in it because the potato pulls out the salt. Because it was too watery, I added some roux to it because I know how to thicken it up. I may not be able to take the pepper out, but I know how to work it for good. I may not be able to take the salt out, but I know how to work it for good. I may not be able to take the water out, but I know how to work it for good. And God, who sits on the throne and sees the gumbo of your life, he knows how to add some stuff and make it work for your good. Is there anybody here who knows God added some stuff? He added some joy. He added some grace. He added some favor. He added some mercy. He added some love. And didn't he work it for your good? Trust God, for we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Goodbye, new psalmist. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But is there anybody here who knows God is able? He's able. He's able to work it for my good. Hey!